Well, today we come to <clears throat> the third question in our Questions About Life series as we bring our time to a conclusion side by side for a time. And the natural question after we talk about how things have gone so badly wrong is how might it be changed? How might it be fixed? How might it be made right? This broken world. I don't think anybody seriously questions that the world is broken. If I was speaking with a materialist, that's someone who believes that the only thing you see is what is, there's nothing else, just the material world. They would most likely point to the advances in human skill, science, medicine and technology. And there is no doubt that they would be right to some degree because there have been amazing advances in these areas. Of course, I might say that quite a lot of those began with Christian influences or Christians involved in them. No less than the present Francis Collins, the Christian who's overseen so much of the answers to the pandemic at the moment. But think, of course, about some of those advances. Well, the lifespan of human beings has increased in some parts of the world, but not in all. Some other parts of the world, it has actually decreased. There have been cures for some diseases. That is true. There are a number of diseases that can be rubbed out as having the effect they once had. But then there are new diseases. We have technology and travel things that have created what we call today the global world or the globalized village. And yet, I have heard quite a bit of unhappy talk about the globalization, how it has destroyed so much of culture and of individuals and locals and so forth. And of course, if you're in agriculture, you're no longer having to go out onto the field with a spade or with a, an ox or with a horse to carve a 10-inch a uh, piece of soil each time you move from one end of the field to the other. There have been positives and there have been negatives. But then we are in a pandemic and there have been three million plus deaths. I don't think you could say that that is advance. We have found ourselves on so many occasions along this journey of pandemic unable to understand how it has happened unable to really get to grips with how we can stop it or change it. And even yet, we're still uncertain about the future, though there have been tremendous strides with the vaccination process. But consider some of the other things that exist in the world. In 2016, there were 40 million slaves in the world. Yes, we know that you know, William Wilberforce did successfully pushed through the abolition of the slave trade in the British Parliament in the middle of the 19th century, but there's still millions of slaves. Child labour hasn't gone out with the Victorians. And I don't think that you could say that that is progress then, since the number of evil things are still happening in the world of so-called civilised societies. For example, in 2019, in the United States, there were 16,500 recorded murders or homicides. There were 16.5 million abortions so far this year, just until now. There's a lot of the year to go. And in the UK, while there was tragically 127,000 deaths with the pandemic, there were 207,000 children aborted at the same period. I think we can go on, but you begin to get the picture. AIDS victims so far this year is 42 million. Suicides, 424,000. I don't think that there's any indication that the materialist has got an answer to the problems of our broken world in progress. And then if you were to speak to the Hindu, they might point to the fact, well, yes, life is hard as it is, but there's the hope of reincarnation that you may well be reincarnated at a better place in the social netting and, and, the, and the packing of life. You might be further up. You might be further down, of course. The Buddhist is waiting for nirvana, where there's no actual fact to say, yes, you reach nirvana. And sometimes these views actually hinder people from escaping suffering and, and the misery that they live in. The Muslim response might say that it is the will of Allah, and we ought simply to accept it. 
So what is your answer to the suffering and the pain and the misery in the world? Well, as a Christian, my answer is to be found still in Genesis chapter 3. It's there where we find well, not only creation, but we find the fall, and we find the origins or the, the beginnings of what will become the solution. When God is speaking to the individuals involved in the fall, Adam and Eve, and to the serpent who is the symbol of Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you, that's the serpent, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Enmity is I'll put a war, there'll be warfare between you, and he, that is, he, that is, the seed of the woman will bruise your head, I mean, he will crush you, he will destroy you. And you will bruise his heel in the process. Now, you've got to take my word for it, but if you start to read the Bible, you'll discover that this conflict, this enmity between the man or between the woman and Satan is part of the story. It's there right the way through, all the way to the end of the narrative of the Bible. And of course, it culminates in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, where he truly bruises the head of Satan, and in the process he himself is crushed in a physical way. He is killed, but he rises from the dead again. I think it's interesting as you consider this narrative, and then somebody says, well, that seems a very strange way, doesn't it, to, to try to explain how things get better? I mean, you're talking about suffering and you're talking about death and you're talking about crosses and that hardly seems an improvement. Well, it's the way the improvement comes. In Genesis 3 verse 15, this is what we call the first gospel or the first announcement of the gospel. Shortly after this, we know that skin or prior to this, skins have been found for Adam and Eve. Skins that are there to help uh, protect them from their nakedness. But of course, in order to get skins, you have to kill animals. Death comes, and with death comes sacrifice. And the whole sacrificial system is described in the scriptures. It's the way that a substitute is taking the place of the individual. They come by faith, and they place, as it were, their hands, the transfer of their guilt to this substituted animal, and their sin is atoned for. But that atoning is not permanent there. It is always looking forward to the perfect one. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, who is called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And it's interesting that this sacrificial system, or some form of it, is found in lots of cultures who are not Christian, that the elements of this notion of that sin has got to be atoned for, cleansing has got to happen, is something that seems to be embedded in the psyche of humans. But it all points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And so he's the one who enters the suffering world. He's not absent. He embraces the suffering, he experiences the suffering, and he will one day end it. He has begun that process on the cross. I would say he has more or less completed it, but there's still the outworking of that. We know that he came... And he rolled back the effects of sin, even in his ministry, when he stepped into the garden of the or the wilderness that once had been a garden, as it were, the wilderness, and was tested there, recorded in Matthew 4. There he comes as a second Adam, and he engages with Satan, and he wins. He rolls back the effects of sin and the miracles. Jesus is the one who has come to deal with the, the things that have gone wrong, the sin and the brokenness and the disobedience. And finally, when we believe this, it changes everything. If we act upon our believing. You see, I've met some people who have said, yes, I believe those things, but they've not ever actually acted upon it and put their trust in what he has done for them and repented of their sin. Then, redeeming us, we become part of this, this process of change, this the Lord's, the work of the Lord through us, as it were, he sends us out to tell people about this so that we then become ambassadors of this good news, the gospel as we call it. So that's one way of explaining how things can be put right. And your friends and my friends, I think, can enter into a conversation on this sort of level because we have all something to talk about and say on this. 
And I pray that you will be one of God's agents of change, taking the message of the gospel to those that you know in the coming days.